Hello, everyone. Um, so first of all, I'm not an archivist. I'm a programmer. And so this talk is sort of targeted towards developers and the tech industry. Um, however, I think that many of these points will still apply to archivists as well. Um, so I really liked Steve Long's motivation for creating Matroska in the first place, which was recording political debates um, to hold people in power accountable. And I feel like this kind of recording, this sharing of recorded information is becoming increasingly important as uh, a type of political act. Um, my name is Igor, I work with computers, and last year, Phil Rogaway published this essay titled The Moral Character of Cryptographic Work. And in this paper, which is addressed to the cryptographic community, Phil makes a point that the work of scientists and engineers is political. And I want to present some of the ideas from this paper, as well as some other related ideas, viewed through the lens of software engineering. So Phil sets the stage with a press conference in London in 1955. Um, and the assembled reporters learn from Bertrand Russell who is a logician, a mathematician, a scientist. Um, but they are not here to learn about a new scientific, scientific discovery, but to receive a political statement. It's a fairly brief statement, um, but it's been signed by 11 of the world's leading scientists, nine of them lo uh, Nobel laureates, including Albert Einstein. And in this manifesto, the signatories urge the political leader of the world to not engage in nuclear warfare. Um, and the, the closing paragraph reads, we appeal as human beings to human beings, remember your humanity and forget the rest. This document would become known as the Russell Einstein Manifesto. And it becomes this, or it became, um, a cornerstone of the nuclear disarmament movement and is remarkable because it was a political effort led by scientists. So this manifesto shows that technical work itself impacts politics, um, such as the Manhattan Project, and also that some scientists decide to overtly take a political stance. And Rogaway calls these the two modes of behaving politically. So implicit politics is promoting a political goal as a byproduct of technical work. Politics is about power. Who has how much of it and uh, what sort? And technological ideas and technological things are not politically neutral. Routinely, they have strong built-in tendencies. Um, our, our hegemonies are mirrored in the products that we make. Uh, lack of controls on privacy, devices that listen to words in your home and turn them into product recommendations, algorithms that perpetuate abuse, machine learning that encodes our biases, um, sign up forms that deny the existence of gender variant people, sensors that don't work for people of color, um, websites that are not accessible to visually impaired people, uh, poor people, non-technical non people. These are things that we make. Product design and engineering matters, and building inclusive products is a political act. The other mode of behaving politically is overt politics. A software engineer can engage in overt politics through activism, and we've been seeing quite a bit of activism regarding the systemic injustice in the tech industry. Um, many high-profile thought leaders have spoken out against the rampant misogyny and harassment of marginalized people. And one project that I would like to mention here is the Tor Project, who in 2014 published a statement of solidarity against online harassment and took a clear moral stance on how they want the people in their community to be treated. Sadly, they didn't quite live up to their own expectations, as some of the recent events have shown. Um, that said, in the same spirit of activism, many tech conferences and open source projects have introduced codes of conduct taking an overt political stance on systemic inequality. Now historically, a willingness to speak truth to power, to challenge authority, 
became a tradition among physics, physicists, one that, according to Rogaway, continues to shape physicists' identity. And I'd say this is certainly also true in computing. There's been many organizations that have been formed to address ethics as computer scientists and technologists. And arguably one of the most well-known organizations in this realm is the Electronic Frontier Foundation who have taken on many legal cases related to privacy, uh, free expression and innovation, including many of the ongoing NSA lawsuits. Um, but there is another side to this story as well. Computing history has, to a great extent, been shaped by money from war and military. Um, one of the early typewriters was created by a company called Remington Arms, which is a gun manufacturer. The ENIAC, one of the first computers, was built for calculating trajectories in World War II. The Harvard Mark, another one of the early computing machines, was used in the Manhattan Project for creating the hydrogen bomb. Um, IBM designed custom punch card machines for the Nazis. The space programs of the moon landing were driven by the Cold War, and now we have NSA surveillance, censorship in China, Iran, and many other countries. And a complicity of all of these modern, everyday service providers that we use every single day. Um, and the truth is that most so-called professionals don't feel any social responsibility in software engineering. And one person to highlight this fact is Kelsey Gilmore Innes, who in her talk, Your Job is Political, asks us to consider the flow of money in the tech industry. And what our labor is funding when we work at VC-funded companies. Because it turns out that rich investors often hold quite some political power, and examples of political actions driven by such investors include school privatization, producing profit for their tech startups, tax breaks, police militarization, and surveillance. Um, Kelsey urges us to pay attention and to become informed. Do you work for a VC-funded company? If so, who are the investors? What other companies are they investing in? What political agenda are they uh, pushing? Um, Caroline Sinders gave a presentation titled When Algorithm Algorithms Fail in Our Personal Lives. Um, and she makes the point that the different social platforms that we use um, have different kinds of communication, and that, they, that these differences are due to the infrastructural design of the platform itself, um, and that systems affect behavior. When we think about machines and language, machines don't understand language. Users provide context to the language, and therefore um, create meaning. And one example of this is um, a lot of Facebook users noticed during the Ferguson protests, which was at the same time as the Ice Bucket Challenge, that um, a lot of the uh, Ferguson content was suppressed in favor of Ice Bucket Challenge. And one of the tricks to get around this was to include the, the word Ice Bucket Challenge in the Facebook message to prevent it from being excluded. Um, and um, in, in our project called the Social Media Breakup Coordinator, Caroline Sinders advised people on access control and social media, and her conclusion was that a lot of people, most people, don't actually understand the privacy implications of most social networks. Um, Maciej Klegowski, I probably totally butchered that name, uh, gave a talk titled The Moral Economy of Tech, um, in which he talks about um, the arrogance that programmers have um, and that they think that, or that many programmers believe that they understand all systems from first principles without prior training due to their own superior power of analysis and that programmers are somehow liberators who will instrument, analyze, and optimize, and create all of the solutions and solve all of the problems. But the real world is not a computer, and approaching the world as a software problem is a category error. 
the tech sector, sector um, maximizes its own comfort. Um, and we pretend that we will make, this, make the world better for all. But what actually happens? So we have machine learning, which um, Marseille calls money laundering for bias. Um, and he makes this point that uh, right now, mechanized surveillance has become the economic basis of the modern tech industry. And I, I think this is really true. Most of the uh, funding these days is based on advertising and data collection. Um, and we have US Customs asking people who want to enter the country for their social media profiles. So what are the results of this kind of surveillance? It leads to uh, deportation, it leads to targeting of minorities or those who uh, dissent politically. And Massier suggests as approaches that we can take that we shouldn't listen to technologies who want to colonize Mars if they can't make our existing streets, can't even make our existing streets safe, um, and to impose limits on storage of personal data, which I think is particularly important for archivists, and to stop treating everything as a software problem and learn from the experience in other fields and from the past. Amelia Abroy wrote an essay titled Towards an Ethical Care. Um, and she describes caregiving as the act of providing assistance and support. And there's sort of three, three aspects of that, or three types. So there's instrumental, which is things like shopping and cleaning. There's emotional, which is listening, counseling, and companionship. And informational which is learning how to alter the living, for example, learning how to alter the living environment for someone um, based on a disability. And, um, and one of the things that she suggests is an alternate view on how we think and talk about moral reasoning. So moral reasoning is often described as sort of an absolute right or wrong. And one of this, and, and her suggestion, or the, yeah, her suggestion is to maybe consider a morality that is instead based in context and relationships and is somewhat more nuanced. And she raises the question of how we value care labor, care labor and emotional work. So in the early 20th, 20th century, there is this movement called material feminism which uh, questioned the separation between domestic work and public life and advocated for um, like collective resources for care and adopting uh, technology to suit them. And so in these writings you find some utopian ideas um, of industrial baby rockers, uh, collective housing communities with communal automated kitchens. And then the 20th century happened, and now we're all living in family houses and driving around cars, and maybe this isn't the best thing to have happened for everyone. Um, and meal, meanwhile, we're still struggling with basic questions like wages for housework. Um, so she poses that tech has a care crisis, and uh, the issue is that we do not value care. We value tech skills. We have this archetype of the genius self-taught programmer who is working alone, yet we still heavily rely on human labor. Um, human resources, catering, cleaning staff, sales and marketing, people management, support, data entry. Lots of this work gets outsourced. And we try and make it as invisible as possible to keep alive this narrative of technology and automation solving all issues of the world. So Amelia concludes that people are not perfect, they need care. And computers and code need care as well. We teach them things. All right, so what can we actually do? Um, well, first and foremost, ask yourself, who are you making software for? Consider the social implications of the software that you design. Consider your personal and cultural biases 
and how they may be shaping the data structures, algorithms, and user interfaces that you are making. Hire people who, who uh, don't look like you and listen to them. Hire people who don't have the same background as you and pay them. If you work on open source, care about accessibility and usability. If you work in data storage, think about surveillance. Make your software inclusive so that it does not reproduce the existing structures of oppression. In conclusion, cryptography rearranges power and so does software. Your code is a narrative, your code is political. Thank you.